Welcome to Execute Chapter 66, a Star Wars fiction podcast where we discuss canon, legends, and beyond. And this week we will be talking about the follow-up to Alphabet Squadron, and that is Shadowfall by Alexander Freed. My name is Beth Van Dusen, and with me as always are Chad Schonk and Ryan Schweck. And first, over to you, Chad. This is your reminder that this is more of a book club than a review show. We will be talking as if you have either done the homework or don't care about spoilers. That extends to any other Star Wars book, as well as movies, shows, cartoons, comics, and video games that may come up. If you plan on reading this week's novel, Shadowfall, by Alexander Freed, you will not want the ending spoiled for you. We're totally cool if you pause this now and come back when you're done. So, Ryan, what will you and the family be doing this life day? (laughs) Well... (laughs) They have announced that this season we're going to get a new holiday special. Now, it is very different from the previous holiday special. You know, it's going to be a Lego show. Um, It is going to star the sequel cast, so Ray and Finn and that whole little group. Um, But, you know, obviously calling it the holiday special. They knew what they were doing. It's a loaded term. I will be very curious to see if they talk about Life Day because there's not Christmas So if you're going to call it a holiday special, you know, I mean, I guess they could do, uh, oh, what do they call it now? The day the empire fell. Uh, I can't remember. So they could not either, (laughs) you know, they could talk about that or maybe they have some new first order holiday, but damn it. I want life day and I want lumpy. Lumpy. (laughs) That that was going to be my first question was, will there be lumpy? (laughs) No lumpy, no chatty. Yeah. I want B Arthur. Bring it on. Come on. I want everything. That's going to be, that's going to be a little tougher. Yeah. Um, yeah. And other... uh, uh, you know what? Okay. It sounds fun. I like. I hope. Hopefully, they have a good time with it. And while still trying to do this kind of fun Christmas special for kids, they make. The, hopefully, they poke fun a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know that there's at least a few nods to people who know better. I Look, want it they... almost to be robot chicken esque. Not that adult and maybe not no. slapsticky, but that kind of humor almost. But yeah, it's just every once in a while, just you know, I don't, I don't know, make a reference to something from the from the special. You know, if yeah. they can throw Grand Moff Tarkin into Rogue One, they can they can insert B. Arthur. They can, yeah. yeah, it's Lego. They can put whoever they want in. Get me, get me the estate of B. Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> in other news, so we are recording this on September the third. So hopefully, by the time you are listening to this, the Mandalorian trailer should have dropped. Um, they have announced the Mandalorian will start October thirtieth. What started Hot as damn rumblings yeah it appears that it is ahsoka is going to be in the trailer i don't know i don't know how i feel about that you know uh, the rumors are she's really only in a scene or two she's not going to be there a whole lot (sighs) i don't know i i'm considering not watching the trailer i don't know what do y'all think Uh, i'd kind of like to be surprised it's like reading a, a teaser chapter I'm going to do what I always do. I'm going to, yeah, that's I'm one. I'm going to watch the trailer once, which is what I always do with Star Wars. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. secondly, you're right, Ryan. You cannot watch it. And then everything on social media is going to be pictures of Rosario Dawson with Liku. Yeah. Are they Liku for, for Tigruta? I don't know what they're called, but they're, they're still called Leku. Okay. You're going to see it everywhere. It's Man. not, it's not going to be an image of you as a, I would say as a human being, but specifically as a nerdy human being, you will not be able to avoid it. Yeah. And I agree uh, with you. I'd rather they not, but it's going to be hard to stay away from. It will be. And kind of following along with that, we got a new interview or quote, whatever you want to call it, from Kathleen Kennedy that I thought was a little concerning. Um, some other people did too. Disney is currently in the process of rethinking Star Wars and what their future plans are going to be. You know, they kind of went through this kind of statement about how they finished George Lucas's vision of the story, you know, which they really didn't, but, and that they have this whole 25,000 years that they can focus on. And so right now Disney's really focusing on, you know, where they want to take the property, which, you know, taken with that is all well and good. However, this is pretty much the exact same thing she said after Rise of Skywalker came out. 
so yeah but that was only that was only like a year and a half ago well but you're telling me in a year and a half <laughs> disney has it figured out like <laughs> all right guys like let's get it together uh, i know but all, all i'm saying is like i agree with you she has said this before they had they said that they also said this after solo yeah basically this is was basically what they said after solo but like i don't i don't get why people are freaked out about it because uh she's been saying that forever we know what that future is and that future is television it is that future is television and i am so okay with that it is and i don't know maybe they're afraid to just come out and say it like you know we think that television is the way to go and really you know i'd like to see some movies you know maybe every I, once in a while i'm not gonna it. say no yeah but i'm not going out. to a movie theater in the foreseeable future but if i had no I, I say this and i don't have the buy i'm a big taika fan and uh -huh. um, i actually uh, uh thor ragnarok is one of my favorite marvel movies that will get me kicked off the needless things network but it absolutely is and i would still rather get the solo lando TV series, I'd rather get one season of that than three Taika Star Wars movies. Personally. Mm -hmm. Like I and I and I'm and I, I think they'll be cool, but I want the shows. The show I have been screaming for years that the future of Star Wars should be a television because the way I like Star Wars is in long form uh, ways, like books and stuff, and that that uh, this is the best in cartoons and and the shows, and this is just the best way to to do that. I agree. And, the, and the Star Wars stories that I want to see personally, they don't translate just like like Solo. Solo was exactly a Star Wars movie I wanted to see, but it doesn't make a giant billion dollar blockbuster. It just mm -hmm. doesn't. And as we saw with The Mandalorian, Star Wars doesn't have to be giant million dollar blockbusters. So, and I'd, I'd just, be I'd be okay with starting to see some books adapted. Yeah. We got say, enough of them. Save your movies for when you have a new planet killing weapon, and that can be all your movies. <laughs> yeah, every That's kind every, of the theme. Every twenty, every thirty years, we'll check in with the galaxy. Yep. You know, uh, although, and I want to point out, and I, we don't want to get into it too much, but I don't know if Finn's going to be in those plans because he's had some not so positive things to say about his Star Wars experience this week. <laughs> John Boyega has. Yeah. Um, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go into him. Uh, I, I ask people to check them out themselves. I don't have it in front of me, and I'm not going to quote the man for him. But I'll let you say this. I agree with a lot of what he has to say. I wasn't there to know his experience, but his dissatisfaction with the treatment of the characters of color in the sequel trilogy is not without merit. No, so, I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, roast the roast Tika. Let's just put it there. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, it just, yeah. So, so I would check out his comments doesn't mean uh, we're anti-Star Wars or anything like that, but I would definitely, it's a conversation worth having, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, we got some new book publishing news, which is obviously our little section of the universe. They have released concept pictures of what Yoda will look like. Um, it looks pretty good. They kind of talk about how, you know, that a lot of thought went into his clothes and what he looks like. They've confirmed that, even though it's 200 years ago, he's already on the council and that he is really into training and younglings. Talk about um, some tenure. Wow. Yeah. Well, and you know, it really, once again, leans back to, hey, Jedi Council, maybe you were getting a little stagnant with your 200 maybe, year member. <laughs> maybe, maybe term limits. Maybe we should talk about term limits. <laughs> That's right. Did y'all see Yoda? No, I did not. It's, I haven't seen it yet. I, you know, it looks pretty good. I mean, it just looks kind of like a younger yoda he looks a little more badass does he look, does he but... look better than phantom menace yoda he does well what's so funny <laughs> is they said they went off phantom menace yoda and kind of went back from there but they clearly went on phantom menace blu-ray yoda and not phantom menace theatrical yoda, that's what i mean which phantom is menace horrifying yoda. yeah <laughs> there's creepy yeah. eyes if, if people uh, i don't even know if it exists anymore does it did it mm -mm. It, it may have been on the dvd was it on the original DVD? I, I think, think it might have been on that original DVD. Is that, that Yoda was originally a puppet in Phantom Menace, and they tried to make him look younger. First, they tried to make one that looked younger, and they messed up, so they put a wig on it and called it Yaddle. <laughs> and then they made another one where they tried to, and where they tried to just to show you that Yoda had gotten younger, but they had, in my opinion, didn't stop to think that thirty years out of nine hundred. Ain't that much. Yeah, that's not going to change his appearance that much. And the puppet looked awful. 
Oh, it's terrible. It looks so bad. Yeah, um, and and so they uh, uh so so I'm I'm glad to see that they're I I I don't I dude I'm down for a teenage Yoda, you know I don't I don't care you know him and his three brothers and their their master splinter I'll take it all like so, what, so whatever. So what's teenage Yoda like? Three hundred years old? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like three hundred years old out cruising the galaxy. Mm-hmm. Using his know. mind tricks to buy beer. It's great. Maybe, <laughs> maybe they'll pull some Matrix stuff and he'll grow up, baby Yoda. The child will grow up to be Yoda, and we'll realize we're in this matrix circle, and then everyone will just be disappointed forever. Wow. Well, and we don't know. Maybe Yoda species, like, it'll just turn from baby Yoda and then a cocoon and then grown-up Yoda. Or maybe maybe, maybe they're like they're like the doctor. He oh, yeah. Regenerate. Some cute little babies. What if Yaddle and Yoda are the same person? <laughs> They yeah, just, no. There was a mistake in their regeneration process. I told I told you before we started that I was legally intoxicated, and this is the road we go down when this happens. Um, <laughs> oh. In line with tonight's podcast, they have announced um, Victory's Price, which will be Alphabet Squadron Part 3, will be out in March 2021. Uh, I think you'll find after this podcast, at least two of us are very excited about that. So am I. So am I. Stop it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and then in the publishing news, I found the most interesting. Uh, as of this podcast, the new Thrawn book, um, Ascendancy, came out a couple of days ago. Uh, for our listeners, yeah. you already read uh, it. Did you? I've read most of it. If you collect or if you buy your books, I highly recommend getting the first edition of the book. The first edition is the only one that will have the blue on the pages, and. It just looks really good. I'm tempted uh, to buy it, even though I read on Kindle. I've been tempted to. Yeah, I really like it. Um, and along with that, Zahn has been doing some press and has kind of put out some stuff that he said in various pieces here and there, but never kind of brought it all together, um, which may explain a lot of the pitfalls of the previous trilogy of Thrawn books. He's talked a lot about the challenge is that with the previous books, the contracts were only one book at a time and he was not allowed to continue stories into the next one. So there could be no cliffhangers. He could reference the books from before, but it could not be one continuous story, which he has kind of not said. That's why the books had a lot of issues that they did, but has kind of hinted at, the frustration of that and how they would have been better without that, which I thought, be, I can I'm definitely going to have to read now. <laughs> yeah. I can understand that being frustrating. I mean, and, and, and it, it makes sense given the fact that they weren't really a trilogy. They didn't mm-hmm. tell. No, story. it you know, was just it, three books by the same and, guy. And they ended up feeling very episodic by right. the end of it. And that by the end, you got nothing out. You didn't get a whole lot out of it by the end. Uh, there was no satisfying character arcs or anything through the whole thing. Right. And now so, these new books are not like that. This was always a trilogy. It is I just ordered my hardback, even though I already have it on Kindle, but I want the blue pages. And I will just tell you, get ready. So many chiss words. You're just like uh, reading and it's like, blah, blah, blah. Hook, chock, balaka. And you're like, all right. <laughs> well, I don't know what that right. means. I will download that one as soon as I get done with. I gave in and finally am doing the audio book of Aftermath. Hey. One of us. We'll talk about that later, too. (laughs) Um, In our toy collecting news, just a couple quick things to point out. Disney released the Galaxy's Edge figures this week. It has been a frustrating process for collectors. They were really holding on these street dates for these four Black Series figures, which were Captain Cardinal from Phasma, which obviously I was very interested in. DJ, the old robot that used to on Star- be on Star Tours, and now he's the bartender at Olga's at Disneyland and World. A Mountain Trooper from Batu from Galaxy's Edge, and a Hondo figure. Um, I'm looking them up now. I didn't even know these existed. They just, they dropped on Tuesday. Uh, no, Sunday. I'm sorry. They dropped on Sunday because my ass was at Target at 7 a.m. Sunday morning in line. Is that the first six inch uh, Hondo? It's not. So that figure was released, I'm looking at it right now, in a four pack, well, three pack really, with Ray and Chewbacca and some Porgs that was exclusive only at Galaxy's Edge. But this is the first time right. he's been a single card release. Well, nobody's coming to, you know. It's it's hard to get to Disneyland these days. Right. The release has been extremely frustrating. Um, Some targets 
didn't get any. Some targets got like two cases of Cardinal and like one Hondo. Like it's crazy and all over the place. People are real frustrated. I've been lucky. I was able to get everybody except for DJ, who, I mean, I'm not real worried about getting DJ. I'll get him if I find him. That's funny. That's the one I want more than any of them. He looks really good, but out of those three, like, he's the one I want. I have such amazing memories of Star Tours. As yeah. So I, I would lo- uh, I, I want that, DJ. I have yeah. People are, I mean, yeah, they're reporting that there's been some restocks. Nobody's really sure if they're going to come back out with them. But, yeah, keep your eyes out. And then the most awesome figure I think they've released in the past year or two outside of the rebels, obviously um, Cad Bane is going to be the European exclusive um, kind of the way the European exclusives work. They release them over there early and then we will get to order him on, I think October 15th. I mean, it's an amazing figure. The box looks great. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend checking out pictures of Cad Bane. He's going to be a really cool figure and probably really hard to find. And then our last bit of news, just an update for all our listeners on the GameStop saga. Oh, no. Did I make some threats about against GameStop? Maybe. <laughs> Did I threaten to burn a GameStop down? I don't know. You know, that's in the past. GameStop did come through. I got my last red card wave. I own Plukun now. I have Kid Fisto. Very happy for you. I apologize, GameStop, for threatening your place. I, I don't feel like you owe GameStop an apology. You know, I will say, after the last threatening of I was going to burn it down, I did get him like two days later. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes it works. Sometimes you got to go hard. Yeah, but Plukun is extremely hard to find. So if you ever see him, I highly suggest getting him. He's well, a- this is normally your domain, but I wanted to hop in real quick. I finished, I got my Zeb uh-huh. uh, from Hasbro Plus, and he's gorgeous. Mm-hmm. I got my chopper finally, and I have an Ezra on the way. So first of all, I'd like to say, where's my old man Rex? That's the next mm-hmm. thing I want. And um, another figure got announced that I, I, uh, I, I pre-ordered from Hot Toys. I pre-ordered the, tw- the, the was a 1-6 scale mm-hmm. uh, Ahsoka Tano from Hot Toys. And you ordered the extremely expensive Ahsoka? I did. Because I eyeballed it, and then I saw the price, and I was like, no. They do layaway. I'm a child. I'm a child. Of, I, they do. They literally call it layaway. I am a child of the '80s, and I can do me some layaway, it, like Kmart style layaway. No problem. You put down a little money, and I don't have to start paying until next year because it doesn't come out till like fourth quarter next year. I, I I just don't trust this year enough to do anything like future planning like that. I I you know what? If I lose my little de- my small deposit, I do. But uh, yeah, no, I did. I ordered. I don't have any hot toy stuff, but this Ahsoka is stunning. Yeah, it's really nice. Right now, I'm looking at my Star Wars toy collection, and obviously, my biggest toy I have of Star Wars is my giant Tie Fighter that's one six scale, and so that kind of leads into tonight's little topic we talked about the ships of the rebellion and the new republic when we talked about alphabet squadron so tonight we were going to hit on the ships of the empire it's hard like do the imperial ships look a lot cooler sometimes on the screen and you know offline together sure but man they are all giant hunks of junk they are efficient. The Imperial motto is, you know, go fast, mm-hmm. uh, 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 hit hard, but, uh, you know, we're not going to give you life support or shields or armor. <laughs> so right. uh, good luck. Well, um, it just shows how disposable they find all of their people. They can get more people. Uh huh. No, that's why, I mean, you know, they've always, it's always been, even, you know, all the way back in early expanded universe stuff, it's always been the the idea that the, the TIE fighters weren't armored. They don't have hyperdrives. They're super light. The, the, the guys are in those big black suits because they, there is no atmosphere. And, uh, and yeah, that they were, they were very disposable. And that's why they would, that's why they use swarm tactics as opposed uh-huh. to dog fighting. You know, they've come out with so many variations. What are y'all's favorite variation of the TIE fighter? I fully support the TIE defender program. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that. Krennic fought very hard against it, and a lot of people didn't like the idea, but it just makes sense. If you give them 
life support and shields, they could do a better job. And you can have better pilots because they live longer than two fights. You're such a Thrawn. You're such a Thrawn apologist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you've got to be pretty pissed if you're a Tie Fighter pilot. Like, you already know your disposal to the Empire, and then you see Vader flying around in his Tie Advantage with all his hyperspace drive and atmosphere and everything, and be like, you know, screw that guy. I have to go with the classic interceptor. Yeah. Just because when it first pops up in Return of the Jedi, I was like, what the hell is that? Because it was a TIE fighter, but it looked like a TIE fighter that could actually move fast, which makes no sense in space. Uh, I also like Vader's TIE Advanced, although I, I, I kind of like the um, Inquisitor TIE Advanced, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, with the curved wings. I, you know, I thought that one was kind of cool looking. Uh, once you get beyond, honestly, once you get beyond two, but, but the most wings I can handle on a TIE fighter is three. I think the three even looks kind of silly. I do. The three, it looks silly, but I, I don't know if that's because we're so used to the classic TIE look. I've been looking at these because I played the TIE Fighter computer game when I was a kid. And so, and a lot of these ships come from there. Mm-hmm. On the on the Rebel side of the game, you had X-Wings and you had Y-Wings and you had A-Wings. And I think you had a Headhunter even, maybe. But like, and on the Imperial side, they had to create new TIE fighters to keep up with the rebel ships because there were at that point there were only three TIE fighters so they created I think it was the advance the I mean the defender uh-huh. I think was created in TIE fighter so I've been used to these different varieties of, of TIE fighters looking this way I've just always thought they were dumb I do like the TIE striker I do think that one's neat well, I now, always thought the TIE bomber was stupid looking yeah very much so Shwek, you may be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, in Rogue Squadron, the original game, did they have an A-Wing to fly? Because I remember unlocking the TIE Fighter to be able to fly, and it was the most fun ship to fly, even if you got your ass blown up every two seconds, because it was so fast and so maneuverable. They did have an A-Wing, but I do remember getting that TIE Fighter, and probably for at least the first hour of having it, all it would be was that start where you kind of float in and then me immediately like turning and crashing into the ground or something because <laughs> it was so fast and like so sensitive. I just like near. All right. <laughs> and again. But yeah. And then so other ships we could talk about. So let's talk about Star Destroyers. Oh, yes. So Star Destroyers. I mean, I think there's no doubt that they're awesome. However. <laughs> Slightly fascistic, but go ahead. Yeah. After so many viewings of novels and movies and everything, every time they're like, oh, it's a Star Destroyer. We're never going to take it down. What are we going to do? I just want to scream. I mean, do you see the little round thing on top? That's a shield generator. All you got to do is blow that thing up, and then you're good to go. Every time. That's the plan every time. And for some reason, we forget the plan every time. So many Star Wars stories do end up involving blowing up an an, an star destroyer which is apparent which is supposed to be an an unstoppable force right like it's like we can't possibly take down that star destroyer but i've got a plan yeah (laughs) what is it it, uh the manufacturing company cnar Mm -hmm. cnar is very busy destroying making fifty thousand different kinds of tie fighters they don't have time to design new star destroyers all the time well i don't know i like to think they had like a board meeting and they were like all right guys the Star Destroyer is super awesome. Wait, aren't the Star Destroyers what? KDY? Okay. Are they? I think they I might. Know. I think they may be a different. Actually, might be a different company. Ah, I just thought CNR de- designed everything. I, I, you, you could be right, but there's K- KDY yards. Go ahead. Sorry. So yeah, I like to think they were like, "Well, the Star Destroyer is super awesome. What can we do to make a better ship?" And all they said was, "Let's just make it like fifty percent bigger." And they were like, "That's <laughs> awesome. What are we gonna call it?" Let's go with Super Star Destroyer. And everybody was like, that's great. Awesome. No creativity, just Super Star Destroyer. So if the Empire had kept going, it would have just been Ultra Mega Star Destroyer. <laughs> it sounds like a Power Ranger. <laughs> I'm going to be that actually guy and say, yes, it was Kua Drive Yards. Oh, like, I'm very mate. sorry Star that I messed right. up my, ma- my ship manufacturing companies. <laughs> I know. I know. Get on it. Get on it. Um, I'm a bad nerd. I'm, I'm going should, home. Should have paid more attention in... Uh, Fictional economics class. Wow. Are there any <laughs> uh, other imperial I, ships that y'all like? I well, I like the. It's funny you talk about Super Star Destroyer. I like the Super Super Star Destroyer, the Eclipse. 
mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. was Palpatine's flagship of the Dark Empire comics because it had literally had one of the guns from a Death Star in it, which I thought was pretty crazy and pretty cool looking. Uh, I'm a big fan of the the Lambda class shuttle. I always thought that was really awesome as a kid. Always makes oh. a great toy too. Every time it's, they do it, it's a great toy, and they've just they've just got a better shuttle than the Rebels always have. And then the other thing, there's also the more modern ones, like you know the New Order ones, like was it just the Tie SF, the Special Forces, or the uh-huh. Special Forces Tie, or whatever, that are basically just Tie fighters with two seats, which I found always found that never uh-huh. really liked the Tie fighter with two seats. Now you can die with a buddy. Come on. Yeah, I mean, I like. I say, I, you know, I'm a Star Wars nut. I like all these stupid little ships. No. Um, but there's some of them, yeah, that I'm, uh, the TIE, is it TIE Avenger? There's the TIE Avenger, and I don't remember what that one looked like, but I remember hating it. I mean, I definitely think the Rebels have the advantage in cool ships. Well, well they've got all... a lot more cultures, and, and there's there's a lot more to them than just... A bunch of dudes, a bunch of humans flying around in these ships because they don't design ships for anybody but humans. Whereas the rebels have all kinds of different societies and species and and they try to cater to a, a little bit broader audience. All right. Well, are we ready to move on to our book of the week? Sure. Yeah. All speaking right. of ships. Yeah. Speaking of ships. Let me get my synopsis out here. All right. This week, we'll be talking about Alexander Freed's Alphabet Squadron, Shadowfall, in which the Empire definitely strikes back. In true Star Wars sequel tradition... Nerd. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, because it ties in. (laughs) In true Star Wars sequel tradition, after a win by our heroes, the Empire makes a surprise attack, foiling a Republic plan just by not showing up and splitting our heroes up in the process to have adventures on their own. Shadow Wings now led by Soren, and I haven't figured out how to say this. Is it Kays? Keys? They regain Imperial control of Troth, seemingly killing General Sindul in the process, leaving our heroes on their own. Aiden, Quill, and Nito find themselves trapped on a barren asteroid with their only escape being the worst Sith smart lock ever. Chas gets groomed by a force-worshipping cult led by a lady with mushrooms growing on her that leaves her with some literature to review later. Nath and Will find themselves helping lead a guerrilla group of rebels, adding a new letter to the alphabet to the squad in order to stop Soren's sinister plot of running away. (laughs) Karos is in a medical tube. Will our heroes be able to come back together to stop Shadowwing once and for all? Will Chaz become that annoying friend that just wants you to listen to an exciting new opportunity she's found? How did they telegraph that betrayal? And it still ended up being so exciting. Will Beth finally be forced to read Aftermath to understand the new characters? (laughs) Seriously, does someone need to call social services about Jason? Only six more months until we get all our answers. <laughs> that was one of my big questions, too. I was like, where in the hell is Jason? I mean, I, to get it out of the way right now, I love this book. I thought it was amazing. Like, I, I think out of all the books of the new canon, I've thought about this one the most. And kind of what went on and where it led things. I mean, you know, we've talked about that first book definitely was a setup book. Took a lot of time to get them all together. Now this one, you know, it separated them. But I think knowing all the characters already, like, I really like the differences in the story and kind of where it led everyone. I I found a lot of surprises in this book. And I guess Chad saw a lot of them coming. But I did not because I expected it to follow a different formula than it followed. And I found it so much more interesting and engaging and surprising. And I've read it three times now just because after having finally, thank you for calling me out publicly, finally started reading Aftermath or listening to Aftermath so that I can avoid the punctuation nightmare. Sometimes shame is all we've got. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And you better believe we're going to be covering those books. (laughs) I've got one more credit from Audible. I'm going to get the second one because I'm almost done with Aftermath. I I did, once I've gotten to Aftermath, I was like, all right, so, oh, this character. Ha ha. Now I know who this character is. So I did find it more interesting to keep reading through it again and go, okay, now I know what's happening with this person. Now I know who the hell this is and why they matter. 
and, and still picking apart the little details of what's going on with chess and trying really hard to understand both chess and quell because they're very complicated characters in the first book that I didn't feel a lot for because I didn't understand them because it really wasn't about them. But this uh-huh. book gets you much more into the people. I felt like I got to know Will and Nath pretty well in the first book, but not so much Quell and Chess. And this book gave me a lot more with Quell and Chess that I think I needed to be able to care about them as a group as a whole more. Uh-huh. What did you think about Soren? Because I think he's really interesting. Like, I think it could have been really tempting. And I think in a lesser book, they might have gone the route of, we're going to bring back the 204, you know, badass ex-captain who's going to just lead him to victory and, you know, all this stuff. When it really was just him coming back to be like, yeah, I'm going to get these guys and we're getting out of here. Like, the Empire's done with, I'm done. I'm going to take them and go. I kind of like that. Yeah, he's a, he's a realist. Mm-hmm. He's, he, I think he's proven he's not he's not a he's not a uh, an ideologue. He's not a he's not a Kool Aid drinker. You know, mm-hmm. he's he's a realist, and it's time to get out of town. So. Uh, I I did. Uh, they're they're going to give me crap for this. I did enjoy the book quite a bit. Just like with the first one, I kind of enjoyed the second half more. But but unlike Ryan, it didn't stick with me as much. It's not about I'm, I'm sure I could find the time. I don't have the willpower to read any book three times. Uh, so I don't know how Beth could possibly do that, especially just in like the six weeks it's been out. I just don't have the will to do something like that. It did have a, a, a darker tone to it. Uh, it, 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 it. Freed really has trying to take up the mantle of the, for lack of a better term, realistic Star Wars writer. You know, like the the characters aren't. None of the characters are black and white at all. It's all gray until we get to the. I still, you'll still gonna, you're gonna have to explain to me that Sith Chinese figure trap. <laughs> that was. You're gonna have to explain that to me because I still don't know what that was. This book did get weird compared to the other one, though. Yeah, but weird in a good way, I thought. Yeah, it just it got weird though. Like it it brought in some elements that you normally wouldn't expect in a squad book. You know. Mm-hmm. So the first note I've got, and one thing, like, I didn't find myself, like, as I was reading it, like, really being excited about it or thinking about it, but it was later after I'd read it, thinking about it, was Troth itself, the planet and the system. So, you know, the system is on the edge of essentially a collapsing black hole, and so it's dark all the time. You know, there's no sun, there's a black hole with some light around it. Oh, hey, real quick. Uh huh. How do Tie Fighters work in a system with no sun? Shh. They they <laughs> just do. Okay. And so they use these kind of solar panels to light up the planet. Sometimes, kind of lights in the sky, I guess. But the more I thought about it, like I think the setting itself was really interesting in the way Freed used it in a couple of different kind of aspects. I mean, one, like there's the very clear when the empire kind of takes back over the planet and gets the governor back, they shut the solar panels down. And that's part of the plan as it gets blown up. So it's dark all the time. So, you know, you've got the very cliche cast back into darkness kind of thing. But I really liked and what I really thought about it, and they talk about it a few times, is that this planet and the whole system itself is slowly falling into the black hole. It's a little more prevalent in Aiden and Yerika's story as, you know, they're getting there faster. But there's a lot of talk about what is this all for? You know, in a few hundred years, this planet is going to be gone anyway. Why are we wasting all this time? I just thought it was a really interesting kind of set for this whole book. Yeah, well, I I think it's a different place than we've seen before in books and especially I've never seen it in TV or movies but I liked that it was something very different and yeah it was why did they think that the Empire would care about taking this place over again when it's doomed Mm -hmm. and I really liked how the Empire got there so you know we've got the rebels set this elaborate trap and set all this stuff up and the Empire just doesn't even show up (laughs) they go straight around it and crash land on this planet now and that's something i did think was i don't know if i 100 percent bought in that kind of 
Soren's plan was to kind of give them a win, but their plan seemed to kind of be, well, we're going to blow up the Lodestar and we're going to take this town back and then we're just going to deuce out. You know, well, I think I, they, they were more interested in, or at least he was more interested in killing Hera, which he thought would be like this huge blow to the New Republic. But, you know, obviously she's not the only person around. I'm sure that would screw up some of their plans and leave an orphan out in the galaxy. It would screw up my plans when I came and burned down their offices. <laughs> <laughs> you know they're mean? not going to let Hera die. They're not. But that was his idea was that, well, if we kill her, then we'll screw up their, their plans for whatever the hell it is they're doing here. And, and our team will feel good about themselves. It was a team building exercise. But see, again, like his whole point is the Empire's done. We need to go. Like, was his plan like, we're going to build a bump and make them all happy. And then when they're all happy, we're going to be like, all right, guys, let's bounce. <laughs> like, we're going to end on a win. It, that, that's how I felt. It's like he, he said that they needed a win. Yeah. So he was going to give them that win and then be like, hey, so you guys are feeling real good? All right, so let's dip. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. The fact that they needed a win doesn't make me fear Shadow Squadron at all. They're kind of crappy at this point. Yeah. Like, it's a whole bunch of, like, new people. And which 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 hurts me for these books because – and I and I agree with all the character stuff is great. The the, the driving force, that the, the thing that they have to do more than anything is stop Shadow Squadron. And all I'm thinking is – why mm -hmm. like if if they if you come across them at some point in a battle sure shoot them down but all of the effort and resources and thought going into tracking down this little group of pilots that i have yet to see be any better than the rebel pilot pilots that's where i that's one of the things to me that breaks down the the series like it, the that breaks down these books um to make me like the some of the parts less than i like the parts is because I don't feel, uh, I don't know, I don't feel any, and maybe that's the point, they aren't dangerous, they're just other people, but then we have kind of a story without an antagonist, uh -huh. and that can also be fairly unsatisfying. But I just, I just don't, I don't, I don't get what the big deal about Shadow Wing is still. I don't know. I, I can see that because they are kind of decimated. After a uh, pandem pandem nay, and so why is the greatest rebel of all time, Harrison Dula, wasting her time? See, I don't really feel like she was. Like, I think she's got other stuff going on. She's trying to get this system back, and so she kind of throws him a bone. Like, yeah, we'll keep looking for Shadow Squadron as long as you still hang out over here and help me do other stuff. And it's, she it's doesn't think it's that big a deal because she also dips to go do some other stuff. Yeah. No, it is. It's just I, I again. I just don't. I don't find them a credible threat. If they're so badass, it shouldn't be so hard to find what they've been doing. Because even they like look at some video and they're like, "Well, that could be them." Like, if I just, this amazing thing. It should be like these guys showed up and wreaked hell, and that well, is just, definitely Shadow Squadron. I just think there's something flawed in it because in order to get past that, he has had to create this as I this. And, and again, I'm not a pilot. I'm definitely not a, a, a an X-wing pilot. But the idea that, and we talked about this with the first book, the idea that the characters can tell who they're dogfighting against by the way they fly mm -hmm. seems so, I'm not going to say impossible. It, it just seems so convenient mm -hmm. uh, in order to create characters out there when they're flying that I, I said, I just don't, maybe if the TIE Fighter comic had gotten deeper into these characters or something for me, but I, I, I don't know. So Shadow Wing, to me, that I like Alphabet Squadron a lot. I don't really care about Shadow Wing. They're just yeah. kind of there. And no, they're they're just some people that nobody sees. But you say that, but they're they're not anymore. They're a huge part of this book. Yeah. Well, and we'll see what, and we'll get to what's going to happen to them in the next book. I think that may change things a little oh, bit. Oh, hopefully, I just I I haven't seen their feat of dastardly do that would make them this boogeyman. Yeah. And and given Imperial training and the way it is, I honestly don't see how anyone could tell any Tie Fighter pilot apart because they're all trained very intentionally not to anymore. be the same not anymore now you know when when you tell a story with with specific characters all of a sudden they're be they have to be better than everybody else yeah most tie fighters pilots suck but not these i think the easiest way to talk about kind of the stories and stuff that happens in this book is to go by our groups i guess and kind of look at the individual stories so, you know, they all obviously get split up. So let's start with Chas. <laughs> you know, poor Chas spends the beginning of the book being a drunk and then ends up 
when she gets stranded, gets picked up by some force cult, which, you know, I really like the idea of force cults. I think it totally makes sense. If there are some like weird force that some people can access, I could totally see that being a thing. I liked her story a lot. I appreciated how like she kept with her, at least for almost all the book, like how ridiculous this was. And she was just using it to get out. But then by the end, you realize like she's bought into this a little bit. Now, the mushroom lady was real weird. I yeah. And I don't really understand the mushrooms going on the lady. <laughs> um, but I liked her story. I thought he wrote a really effective way that they kind of brainwashed her. They didn't force her to join. They didn't try to do anything to her. They just kind of took her in and let her listen and, you know, let her have her ship at the end. But those tapes were underneath the seat, kind of knowing, doing, doing their homework that they knew she did this. They they left a pamphlet under her windshield wiper. <laughs> they sure did. And I just imagined her in the next book, like I said, it's going to be a lot of like, uh, hey, you guys doing anything? I got these tapes, you know, we could just listen to. They're really cool. <laughs> like, you know, I don't buy it, but let's just listen to the tapes a little bit. I, yeah, I thought for a while there they were going to just have her kind of buy into it for good. Mm -hmm. know, just to have it be her storyline. But, uh, but yeah, it does make sense. I like the idea of these force cults. Because if you think about it, not every Catholic is a priest. Most Catholics aren't priests. The, the the idea that that in Star Wars you have this thing called the Force, and uh, the way we see it is every person who is a Force user is a Jedi Knight or a monk or a witch or something. And you're like, why wouldn't there just be normal people? That mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you think about it as a religion, I mean, a religion around the Force, that kind of makes more sense than Christianity. I mean, you know, I can read stories about. Jesus turning water into wine and kind of believe that's true. A force cult, I could totally see some dude pick up a starship with his mind. Like that is real and happening. Well, we're, we're, we're yeah, remember we're we're living now. You know, it's rare and 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 it depends on when you are in the galaxy. But but as viewers, we are playing in a world where we know God exists, basically. <laughs> yeah. Right. Where we have been given proof of some sort of God. And that do that does and should I think should more maybe change how you tell stories because that that's a very different world than what we live in. And, and any kind of supernatural movie with ghosts and stuff, yeah, the first thing should be like, oh crap, go God's real. I mean, and we've seen hints of those with like the um Guardians of the Wills. The Night Sisters are essentially a Sith cult. Yeah, but they're all Force users still, right? Right. They're all still Force users. Well, and it's. They, it's Indeed. something you have to remember when when we read these books and watch these shows and they're all happening in different timelines. We're at a place that's pretty far removed from the Jedi. So we're dealing with people who don't know anything about the Jedi as a whole. They just have heard stories passed down at this point. So they're just basically like taking the Jesus stories and, and making a religion out of it. Except but, it's real in the fact that some guy can pick up a spaceship with his mind. But to most of them, it's a myth. To most yeah. of them, it's still myth. The cults it's make total sense. And I, I found Ch Chas much more interesting in this book because I didn't get her character in the first book with her hero worship of Jin Erso, who she met for all of five minutes, and why she had such a death wish in this book. Once she starts opening up to the cult and talking about what happens after all of this is over to her, I was like, oh, yeah, now I get where she's coming from. Mm -hmm. Now she doesn't want to become what she feels like she's destined to become and what I'm sure happens to a whole lot of people after all this is over. Well, and that makes the Jen thing make sense. Like, yeah. Jen was this great rebel who was hardcore to the cause. And then got to die. There's no after the war for Jen. Um, and I think that's how Chas kind of sees herself. Jen did, yeah. never had to learn how to how to lead, you know, how to run a galaxy. She never, you know, while, while Leia had to survive it and then try to build a government mm -hmm. <laughs> and keep peace, Jen, Jen never got to do that. Jen died a soldier. Uh, let's see. Which story should we go with next? Let's go with Will. Definitely, and definitely Karos. Let's well, let's save Karos because there can be a lot of speculation for that one. Uh, let's go with Nath and Will. I, you know, 
I thought it was odd, at least for me, out of all the stories, theirs has the most kind of action and the most war. But it was the least one I was interested in. Yeah. Like I liked it. Um, and obviously I liked it because as we've talked about many times, I'm really into that whole having to become rebels again and this is who we are kind of thing. And so, you know, it's very much that guerrilla warfare on the ground and that kind of stuff. But as a story itself, there wasn't anything too much that stood out for me outside of Will kind of becoming this leader. Well, Will spent so much of the first book whining about wanting to go home that I was just pleasantly relieved that he kind of cut that back this book. Mm -hmm. And and it's finally kind of came. Him, you're giving up on that, right? Or at least deferring it right mm -hmm. but oh. he stepped into a leadership role because because the group was split up and the thing that i liked about nath in this book was that for reasons i can't quite still figure out he gives quell many opportunities to do some bad stuff because he gives quell the opportunity to kill adon if she wants to and then he gives her the opportunity to cover her ass when the rest of the group finds out about Operation Cinder. And I can't quite figure out his motivation behind that because he really he kind of likes her and he's kind of rooting for her. But I don't really see where he's coming from yet, maybe till the next book, with giving her those opportunities. I think Nath is the one that gets her. I think Nath is the one that sees, I think Nath's big thing is seeing who people really are and where they're going. We've seen him do it with Chas. We see him do it with her, I think, because he knows her secret, but I think he sees who she could be. He does it with Will, you know, knowing that he could be this leader. And I think he does it like for himself. He, you know, on paper, Nath should be the one leading. But he knows that's not who he is, and that's who Will is. Will also looks – have you ever seen a picture of Will? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Will looks completely different than he, I thought he would. I think I almost envisioned Will almost looking like Ezra, but maybe a little older. And that is not what Will looks like at all. <laughs> nope. But that's just a side thing. <laughs> um, I do think, and like I talked about on the intro, my favorite thing about the whole – story with those two is you know it's this big fight like we're gonna get a stronghold we're gonna fight back we're gonna reclaim it and the whole time it's just soren being like how the hell did we get out of here that's all he's doing <laughs> like all these people die all like you know they lose tons of people they lose tons of stuff and really if they had done nothing the empire just would have left I mean, they would have left that governor there, but I, I just felt like the, the stuff with them and the ground troops to me was the least interesting parts of the book. Yeah, I agree. Because you don't you haven't built any characters in these ground troops. They're just fodder. So yeah. when they're out getting killed, it's OK. Some more people died that I just found out their name like two chapters ago. So meh. Mm -hmm. and I think they were building up and I can't I don't have her name in front of me, but the V wing pilot. So we added our V-Wing. Like, I felt like they were kind of setting that up, that she's going to be the new member of Alphabet Squadron. But I could not tell you probably a single thing about her. Nope. So maybe we'll see her in the next one. So, yeah, I mean, I think we agree that's the worst. And it's not a bad story. Don't get me wrong. But out of all of them, it's probably the least interesting. So the next one was our lovely Aiden, Quill, and Ido on their little weird planet of wind and rock shooting out of the ground not a lot happens in it but i found it so interesting like i liked all the drama of that one especially knowing that you know aiden because he had been hurt and couldn't tell had released to everybody who quill was and then we got you know some of that background of how you know what ito is from and aiden and Karos and why they know each other. And I kind of like that year. It's still, it's still a punk move. Oh, it totally was. It but was you know, it's well within his character, though. Like, he does not actually give a shit about these people. Like, she is a tool no. to him. And, yeah. you know. Cassie and Andor would have done the same thing. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. 
and I really like like there's so many moments you know where Erica is like I could just kill him now and be done with it <laughs> and then she doesn't moves on I kind of thought the Aiden you know Karos meeting each other in the prison it it was good I think a little cliche but you know I liked it and then you know the big obviously part of that story was the Sith temple with the crappy lock <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so when they first find it and ITO first says something about it responds to biometrics or some crap like that, I was like, if they reveal that Quell has force powers, I'm fucking leaving and I'm not coming back. This book is done for me. <laughs> I thought that too for a minute. I was like, oh god, if she force pushes this thing open. Um, well, what I thought was funny, the way it, they kind of explained this Sith temple was that it was a big kind of tuning fork looking thing with the lens in the middle up there. And all I could picture from then on was like Sauron. From That's exactly <laughs> what I thought. <laughs> it's like, like they got it. They got to trick the eye of goddamn Sauron <laughs> into opening the door. Yep. And they don't even have Gollum with them. <laughs> I, but yeah, I mean, Chad, I think it definitely was a little confusing. I mean, the nearest I could tell, it just replays some bad memories and makes you feel real bad, and you just kind of have to accept it and walk through it and ignore all the pain, maybe. I just, I just felt like I've seen her pain. I know what her pain is. I know what she did already. <laughs> so this process of like drawing it all out of her felt so tedious to me. I'll agree. It, it felt like it went on a little long, but. We know what she went through, but she has not accepted what she went through. I, her motivations became a lot more clear from this. No, it did. It did. It just felt like it was a long way to get there when maybe a nice, you know, talk over tea could have done it. <laughs> Droids don't drink tea. Well, I don't need him. Fine. <laughs> they, can, they can have an oil bath together. and talk. I think it might have been more effective if instead of just walking through the vision while it's happening that kind of makes it open. If they had kind of gone with the, yeah, you get world between pushed world. into all this craziness, like the worst things you've ever done and you just accept, yeah, that's who I am. And then the Sith door opens. I think that'd be a much more kind of Sith thing to do. Like yeah. it shows you terrible stuff and you're like, yep. And then off you go. For some reason, the stuff with uh, when it ended up, ITO was actually just torturing her. Yeah. <laughs> like that reveal was really cool. Oh, no, that part was amazing. Yeah. That was the best scene in the book. Uh, I, the best ITO, scene in the book is when, was when she realizes he forgot that he's a good guy now. It was really powerful. Like, yes. And was. I felt terrible for ITO. That was a movie moment. That was a hardcore movie. I moment. know when when she shoves the, the data chip from her. Poor lost astromech into his eye. I'm just like, <sighs> <laughs> I'm really hoping, you know. So once she gets in, we get this Sith ship that she takes, and I mean the description of it sounded awesome. It's got like some like bone controls, or it looks like bone, and I mean I guess this Sith thing was just a garage of some sort. <laughs> um, I I would like to know more about upon the Darth, ship, though. Stumbled upon Darth Bane's garage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of wondering, and this is probably, once again, tying to Aftermath somewhat. You know, they talk about that this is one of the places the Emperor was obviously looking for something. I wouldn't be surprised if that ship can get you, if not to Exegol, but to the Unknown Regions somehow. Like, that's what this thing is. Now, yeah. I don't know if they'll go into all that, but... Yeah, I mean, it might be simple enough. It was Sith-related, so Sheev was looking. Sheev wanted a sweet new ride. He had people all over the galaxy looking for Sith relics, and that was just one of them. So, yeah, overall, I thought that story was – it was good. I found it, you know, interesting enough. It yeah, seemed to go I, on a little long. Like, I was kind of like, I'm not sure how she's still standing. I will admit, the four, the fourth door, the fourth door stuff, uh, it, it lost me a little bit, but I enjoyed it. And then kind of tying into that story, which I found hilarious – just because it ties into all the wreckage. I don't know what the stupid messenger droid is made of, but they need to make <laughs> everything out of the messenger droid. <laughs> well, yeah. Sheev really wanted to make sure he had a good droid. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. That to do nothing. To do nothing but issue one command and then just exist annoyingly forever in yeah. Soren's eyes. <laughs> that thing better do something in the next book. It's like it's it's like it's waiting for a tip. 
It's like <laughs> it's like it can't. It's like a candy gram. It came and did its job, but now it's just standing there awkwardly waiting for you to like slip it twenty bucks. <laughs> like even even Soren is like, I don't even know how this thing got here. <laughs> Who brought this thing well, aboard? Why is it here? If someone honestly just gave it a couple of credits and like a pat on the shoulder, it'd probably go home. Yeah. <laughs> but no, they're cutting their palms open and bleeding on it. I don't think that's what it wants. <laughs> Yeah, it's getting real culty there too, huh? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, there's definitely a cult growing around the messenger roid. Maybe it'll tie into Chassis cult. It'll be the new leader. <laughs> or it'll it could tie into the cult on Exegol. Who knows? Whatever. It, it'll kill the fungus woman and become their new god. And then our final little story is Karos. Not a lot of story there. Nope. <laughs> why did Except... they fr- Why did they fridge Karos? <laughs> why did they fridge her? Well, she, I thought she's beginning all heroic. Just, yeah. That she's like sneaking off to help him and disobeying orders to save infantry purposefully. Yeah, I like that. Um, just not the second half of the book. <laughs> and and then her, uh, you know, her weird little trophy case that <laughs> Shaft finds. Oh, yeah. No, she's got a little bit of Hannibal Lecter in her. That's for sure. Yeah. Because uh, she's got Republic shit in there, too. And she talks. Yeah. Well, she talked in the first book, but only once. Mm-hmm. She says that one word once, and this one, then she talks a little bit. But all right, so what do we think she is? All we know, all right, what do we know? She has weird, far apart eyes. She's got some metal plates on her head. She's insectoid of some kind, because they did describe plating, and, and it, it just made her sound insectoid, but... Is she burpine? I don't know. She has black lips. I, I don't know that she's something that we've seen before. She doesn't fit the description of a species that I know. But when she's I, also been – has she been burned or something, did they say? Yeah, she's, she's had yeah. several things done to her. Now, I'll admit, when I first read the passage, I was pretty excited. And I saw the black lips, far apart eyes, insectoid-like. She's bald. I was like, holy shit. Asajj Ventress is back. <laughs> <laughs> and I got real excited for a minute. Like, she could be a nice sister. Yeah, I kind of thought that. But, I mean, the insectoid part kind of throws yeah. it off. But, I, I mean, mean all, it, if, all of my stuff's from, I mean, I said the only ones I said there's a verpine of Killix. We don't want Killix. She's Verpine's, definitely not in Ocean. She has no wings. I, I, I don't know. I hope it's what and not a who, though. I hope we don't find out she's, you know somebody we know already and well and that's what i was gonna say i'm kind of happy it appears that is not what it was you know i was really afraid it was going to be some old rebellion hero or something it's like Jace, that it's jason sandula <laughs> that'd be but hilarious you wanted it to be a chiss after the end of the first book and i was actually okay with that i yeah, still that would, would love for her to be a i chiss. think that would have been awesome but <laughs> yeah. now that she's something a... completely different mm-hmm. i i don't have any idea i am interested I'm mostly interested because the book has told me to be interested because uh. by making it a mystery, they're just telling you, you should be interested in it. So I am, but um, I mean, it doesn't affect my life who she really is, but when I'm reading the book, I want to know, which do you think of these characters is alphabet to the character that checks in during the battle of Exegol? Freed, Freed has said that, yes, that is a member of alphabet squadron at the battle of Exegol. I can't remember. Is it a female voice or a male voice? It, there is no it's not in the movie it was only in the oh. oh that's right i so feel it's, like it's will that's what i would guess that's my gut reaction is it will's somehow going to make it through all this because he's the one that wants out isn't he yeah, yeah he's a, oh yeah so if he's the one that wants out then he'll definitely still be doing it in 30 years right <laughs> yeah i mean it's star wars so you yeah. know we yeah. drag four wedge well, back in i don't even think <laughs> that i think that's i think that's just life <laughs> Yeah, because really by the end of this book, or at least by the end of his arc, he's kind of given up on the idea of home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Although I would expect Will at that point to be Alphabet One. Or – Unless Quill's still around. Honestly, even thinking about it harder, is Will even still just a regular pilot at that point? Wouldn't he have become the commander that he was growing well, to be? Well, unless he I, goes home at the end. It's, yeah. But it's 30 years later, so yeah. – you could also – so just like with all those other ragtag ships showing up at the end of Rise of Skywalker, he could have just been one of the people that hopped in his ship, and that was his call sign. Yeah. Plus, you know, he could be – it doesn't matter what he's flying, right? But that's who he was. He was Alphabet 2. And that's, you know, like, like when, when uh, they keep calling uh, Luke's X-Wing when um, uh, Ray is flying it, they still keep calling it Red 5. You know, uh-huh. it's like it's just what people call the ship necessarily. It doesn't really 
you know, it doesn't matter. I just think that's who he that whoever it is, that's just what they identify as. I, I picture Nath as older, so I don't picture him still being in. I'm going to guess. And Karis wouldn't say anything. I'm yeah. I'm going to guess it's not Quell, Ryan. <laughs> I don't know. It's I'm still it's definitely possible. But why? Why is there? Why? After reading this book, why would we probably think it's not Quell? First of all, Beth, I would like to say that I'm utterly shocked you did not see this coming. I assume this was coming from like the second chapter of the first book. Wow. Um, <laughs> but I but see, that's my thing about it. I knew it was going to happen. I knew she would probably go back, you know, eventually. But somehow Freed still made it exciting to me. Now, a lot of that probably is because Sloan, he went to Sloan. And you don't think she's actually gone back, though, right? I think we're going to see – No way. I think she is. I Well, I think at this point she believes she's going back, and mainly because you know her relationship with Soren. I was going to say she went back to Soren. She didn't go back to the 204th. Yeah. I think sure. she's going back at this point really honestly going back to the Empire, and I think she's going to get back and then – having gone through all this other stuff with Alphabet Squadron, realize that, you know, yes, Soren is the one that told her to leave, and she was on that path, but that's not who she is anymore. Okay, Beth is going to get this. I'm going to call this a spike at the end of Season 6 of Buffy situation. (laughs) I think, I don't think she's gone back to the Empire. I think we're at the end of that battle, and... She has torched herself with her friends. When she has found out what she has done, they have made it very clear. Despite the fact that she's like their commanding officer, they still tell her to go fuck herself. They're not going to fly with her. That uh-huh. did seem that seemed a little uh, nonsensical to me. But that that when all is said and done, at first I didn't think she was defecting. I thought she was just pulling an Incredible Hulk at the end of Age of Ultron. You know, she's just getting her Quinjet and just you know sail off into the sunset because she didn't have a home anymore. And so it was a nice twist when she showed up with them. I think that the, what she believes is the only redemption she has with her old, her new family is to help them take down her old family. Huh. And so that she is going back not to join them, but she's going back to make them to, to, to make amends and take them out because she's not going to be welcome with them flying next to them. So she's going to try to take them down from the inside. Now she may not believe that now, it, uh, going to your concern, she may not believe that now, but personally, I don't know because this storyline is not that dissimilar in a way from Tam on Resistance. If anyone's watched Resistance, um, yeah. So, but I don't know. I, I I don't think it was her plan all along, um, or anything like that. I don't think she's been a spy because uh, we've been in her head too much for that to be intellectually honest for the writer to even do that. Yeah, no. I didn't see it coming because my head still goes to classic Star Wars where. The underdog you don't expect to show up at the end and save everybody shows up at the end and saves everybody. So at every point when one of them was in danger, I kept expecting Quell to show up and bail their asses out. Like I kept expecting her to swoop in and save Nath or swoop in to save Will. or In her Sith wing. She called the S wing. Yeah, she totally <laughs> I, the wing. I, I kept expecting a Han Solo type woohoo and you're not no you're not wrong sometimes as I said uh, uh guys what was it um uh year when was Rise of Skywalker was that a year ago two years ago whenever that was who the hell knows um sometimes you got to pull the damn X wing out of the water and yeah sometimes um you know you just need to pull that trigger and yes I was expecting her to I was waiting for the moment where she got back into their good graces but. I think Freed's conceit is what she did was so damn awful that nothing, nothing is going to – I mean what it feels like is nothing is going to fix that relationship. Well, yeah, and lo- logically, you know, her saving Will wouldn't redeem her in the eyes of everyone who knows really bad stuff she's done. She wasn't just some spice runner. She destroyed a planet. But if she goes so, off and sacrifices herself to take out Shadow Wing. Right. That's a then, whole different story. Then that could change her squad's view of her. Again, I'm giving her, you know, more credit than maybe she deserves. We'll see. I well, just more credit she, than she's earned yet. 
Yes, but she is our lead character, and so you know, she she is the when a trilogy starts and we spend our first couple chapters with that character, that's the character I'm going to probably center my attention on, and consider that that character is the heart of the book, and I think she still is. And I I just have a hard time. And again, maybe we're going to go full on cynical with it. But in Star Wars fiction, I I want some heroism. And so I'm hoping she's uh, I'm hoping she's going the equivalent of undercover. So so what will happen is that she'll back into the old neighborhood. She'll sacrifice herself to save everybody. And Chas will be so pissed off. Or they here's the here. She sacrifices herself and helps from the inside and they never find out. So they yeah. still end up hating. That would be the more interesting die. choice. So they still end up dating her, to, hating her till the day they die. But again, there's a million ways to do it. I'm not writing to book for him. He's doing a fine job on his own. It's completely possible she's come back to being uh, an an, uh, an imperial, and that she's just a survivor, and she's gonna go wherever she's safest, and whoever is gonna accept her. I'm hoping there's more to it than that. I, I'm looking forward to the interaction between her and Soren in the next book. Because I'm very interested in what is going to happen with that relationship because maybe it was obviously she, very close. Maybe she thinks she can flip him. He flipped himself. He he right. got away. So, so maybe she can – she thinks that because she knows that about him that if she can get next to him. But she doesn't know that he got away. Well, she's upset because she thinks he was running away too and he didn't. Yeah. Yes. She doesn't know about his whole Devin – alternate life i maybe forgot about the devon are we gonna get more into the devon maybe she's maybe she's coming to? To, maybe she's coming to coming to stick a vibro knife in his neck <laughs> i the, think she just wants answers i think she just wants to know like you told me to leave and you were gonna go too what from happened him, from him yes i think yeah. She wants yeah with the one you set up chad i could see some like interesting like everybody thinks you know nobody knows about her sacrifice but i think it would be really cool to let chas know just because of her worship of Jin and this character that sacrificed herself right. to stop the empire and it, and it kind of transfer that to quill and i have no idea how, how it's gonna go or how it should go it's just it, it just would occur to and it doesn't even have to be a sacrifice it could be a happy heroic ending you know where where she does work with them to take down the fighter wing and then by the end you know, maybe she retire. You know, they let her retire in, in, or in something. Um, cause, cause I think I, the one thing I think is true is I just, which is weird to me. Like, announcing Alphabet Squadron as a trilogy, I guess, makes more sense to me than than um, if this has happened in the Rogue novels where there wasn't really a set number of them. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like Alphabet Squadrons existed for about a week and a half. And at least it's what it feels like, right? You know, uh-huh. we, we've had a half a book and then another half of a book. And now something has driven a rift between them that doesn't seem possible to heal. Just doesn't seem possible. So we got to have Alphabet Squadron for about five minutes. Uh-huh. And that I find a little weird, except for understanding that it's just that it's a trilogy telling a, a complete story and that Alphabet Squadron is probably not meant to be around forever. Uh-huh. But. I think on that, though, like how they feel about Quill is not, you know, when they got the message that it's a teammate portrayal. It's more of a, yep, we knew exactly what this was and we were exactly right. You're still an imperial piece of garbage. Yeah. Get out. Well, I mean, she's a flat out war criminal mm-hmm. and, and it doesn't matter if she wants to fly for the rebellion um, you know, you still got to go to the Hague and stand trial. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, you know, if if uh, if people at Nuremberg had said, well, but we want to come join the U.S. Army, uh, some of you still got to go to trial. You know, and, well, and I don't. Some of y'all get to go build weapons, though. <laughs> some of you do. Yeah, the smart ones do. Yeah. But come on, yeah. the smart ones get to go build and, weapons. And that's what happens in the first book is they take away all the people that are useful. Yeah. <laughs> The smart and all the people that are useful, like, oh, yeah, we'll take you guys, but uh, you, oh, you were just a pilot? All right, you stay yeah. here in the detention camp. I, I, I misspoke. The the smart ones get to get us get to help us get to the moon, and then the uh and then but and then the the middle ones are the ones that are are getting uh screwed over. But yes. So yeah. so maybe Quell goes to space Argentina. Yes. Yeah. Like I mean, well, I mean, yeah, and, and we joke, but this is all. You know, this has all happened before and it'll happen again. Mm-hmm. But but the I but but yes, if she there is a difference between her being a rank and file fighter pilot 
in the Imperials and her literally pulling the trigger on destroying an entire planet. And whether and, and that's very Nuremberg trial, you know, um, uh, I'm just following orders type stuff. But I just don't know how any of them ever forgive her. I just don't know. I just don't know how they come back from that. And so I just don't feel like I, I feel like there is no such thing as Alphabet Squadron already. Yeah. I feel if they forgive her, it's cop out. I yeah. yeah. Like it. So I'm saying like like you either the only way she gets forgiven, I think, is if she dies. Mm. <laughs> and like, even then, do you still forgive them or you just go, OK, well, you felt bad just, about it. You know, she's got a lot of red in her ledger and she's trying to wipe it out. Wow. Yeah, but Black Widow didn't kill a planet. That we know of. We don't. That, we don't that know. That movie hasn't come, come out yet. We don't know because of goddamn COVID. <laughs> that movie COVID, could get crazy. <laughs> if, if we had been for COVID, maybe she did. Uh, now, uh, now we'll pay $150 on Disney Plus next year to watch. <laughs> so obviously the most exciting part of this book is Admiral Sloan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I cannot tell you how happy I was. Like it, I, he did it so smart too because they talk about her throughout the book, like little mentions here and there, and it totally read as like just a you know check in, kind of tying the canon together about where we're at. It's a, and it's so running parallel with aftermath, right? Yeah, because she hasn't consolidated yet, and she doesn't. Masamata is still on Coruscant. so. But there's only like a six month window. There's yeah, all this stuff is happening in. It's right in there because she's got command. They talk about that she's gathering ships and that she's got a decent force. So, I mean, it's smack in the middle of aftermath. We're, we're going back to Jeddah next book, aren't we? I, or to Jakku, to Jakku, I mean, we're going to yeah. end up at Jakku, right? I, I don't know how we don't. Yeah. Like, I think that's going to be really interesting to see kind of like where – they're at like where this fits into those other books i mean maybe maybe it's something where it happens during jeku but like it just feels like time was yeah it just feels like we're just with with them wanting to make jeku like the you know uh, the the waterloo of, of star wars you know it's oh. the battle of yavin timeline moment now right yeah it's like it's the end of the official end of the war uh-huh. um it feels like with how the books are going there's no way they're not that's not where the books are heading. There's yeah. just, it just can't. Which is going to make it interesting because if it is right in that timeline, Quill can't do anything too crazy. Like she can't cause a major blow to the Sloan's armada because we would have seen it already. So I don't know. She could take a shadow wing though. Right. And they just, yeah. And that's it. probably what's going to happen. I'm only halfway through the first aftermath book. So I, I know of these characters. I'm still trying to work my brain through Mr. Bones. <laughs> Mr. Bones is awesome. I question your a, understanding uh, of the word awesome. He gro- I, I'll say he grows on you. He grows. <laughs> uh, they it, all it, do. It, it, it all, could it just all be. Works. It yeah. could just be the voice reading. It all. It, no, it was tough to handle. It. It all grows on you. After the entire aftermath saga grows on you. Yeah. By the, um, by the end of it, you're only thinking in third person and in, in, in present tense and it, you you just you buy into it after a while. It's gonna grow on me like a fungus lady with the force, right? Yes, with much uh-huh. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. What other little notes did I have? Oh, I got two other notes. One, and I don't know if y'all noticed, there's a scene where and it's towards the beginning where they talk about Vader. Do y'all remember this? Yes. I think so. I really like they talk about Vader and specifically say, yeah, in the beginning, he was crazy. He was like killing people left and right, you know, using force all the time. And now, like towards the end of the war, that all stopped. And I think that's the first time I've ever seen them kind of acknowledge like a difference in Vader. You know, trying to kind of reconcile the Vader we see sometimes in the comics and other places where he's doing all this crazy stuff and the one we saw in the trilogy. I just well, kind of liked Free did that. Or or it, what, or is it pointing to – because to me the demarcation point there is his encounter with Luke and Bespin. Mm-hmm. 
so the time so the, or or at least his, his his when he discovers that Luke exists that's to me what they're talking about hmm. is that's when things got more subdued uh, you know, that's how, I didn't, that's how I didn't put that together because remember the end of Empire Strikes Back what's one of the big things that happens at the end of Empire Strikes Back Vader doesn't strangle um is it uh Piet yep he doesn't yeah. strangle Piet for making a mistake yeah and so and that's exactly what it says in that thing he stopped killing people for making well no eventually he said he was killing for people making mistakes and he lost heart or whatever but like I think that's referring to the moment when like that exact moment in Empire when and again it's another Empire parallel right when uh from this book which has a lot of them where Vader was just like you know uh, where Vader all of a sudden got like 0.01 percent more towards the light than uh-huh. that very much. and 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 it is interesting to watch again it is interesting to watch Vader's <laughs> timeline in that way emotionally because I think there's there are more shades of emotion in between um Revenge of the Sith and Return of the Jedi than people I that I, I'd like to see people explore those more um because there, there there's definitely different things but yeah he he but but it also it could have a lot to do with the fact that he was a slow old man. That is true. Um, I I put it down to slow old man, but yours is much more interesting. Yeah, I agree. I didn't think about the Bespin part. That's really cool. Um, and then my final note, and this is probably one of my favorite things in the book that it took me a while to catch on. Have you noticed what Freed does with the names? And how he refers to people. No, it's clearly not. So explain. He, when they are in battle, any scene in battle or military stuff, it's always last names. And any scene that's like a personal one, it's first names. Always. Okay. Almost always. And it's, you start like when you notice it, it's very interesting in the scenes where it flips when he calls her Yerika versus when he calls her Quill. Same with Will. Like, it's obviously a very purposeful way in which he's using the names, and I really like it. Like, when you're supposed to connect and do this personal stuff, it's first names. Right, and, and yeah, it's it's kind of represents the two people that they are, mm-hmm. like the fighter pilot and the person. Yeah, um, and and also though. I would say somewhat challenging in a book because you have to keep track of that a little bit more. Well, and I think that's why I noticed it. I think yeah. early on I didn't catch somebody and I was like, wait, who? I think it was with Nath um, that I was like, wait, what? And then I started noticing it more and more. But yeah, I just thought it was a really cool thing he does. Yeah, I didn't I, pick that up at all. So we did get one major casualty, one major death in this book, right? I would say. We got two. Do? Yeah, why Adon- do you hate why do you hate droids? Adon and ITO. <laughs> okay, fine. ITO as well. But Adon, I you know, I would Adon who seemed to be such a big character. So I thought that was a it was it's worth noting mm-hmm. that, that he passes away in this book since they they have yet to kill off any of the pilots really, you know. Yeah. Well, well, the, re- I think- the reason I've read it 3 times now is because I was rereading it again this week to get ready. And I had just gotten to the point where Quell finds him and says he's he comes to a little bit from his stupor and says, I'm sorry, after yeah. he asks how long it's been. And she says it's been a week. Yeah. And he immediately apologizes. She doesn't know what it means, but it means that he told everybody who his, she really was. His time released his time released bomb went off. And and I think he really is sorry. Oh, no, I, I agree. I, I agree with that. I Although agree. he could have maybe once he started to develop a better relationship with her, cut that off. That's kind of why I think Yurik is really going back to the Empire or at least going to try to, yeah. you know, because she lost the only one that kind of talked to her like a person. And she kind of was starting to form that relationship with him, with Hera in those briefings. Even though even though he knew they were mm-hmm. still starting. You know, that was the thing. He knew her secret and still wanted to work with her. You know? Yeah. And so she's lost him. And now Soren's all she has left. Maybe. Well, I I think also it was part of it. The, re- the relationship 
change so much when they were on that creepy little Sith asteroid. Because he opened up to her in a way that wouldn't have made a lot of sense otherwise. Yeah, it's very know. Zeb and Agent uh, Karras. Yeah. And they're in their old cave, right? Uh, but yeah. Well, do, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Do y'all have any other points about the Shadowfall? Uh, no, I'm looking forward to the next one. No, I am very excited to see where the next one's going. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, like I said, out of all, you know, the Disney canon books, which I really wish we had a new word for that. I mean, I guess it's just canon now. I think kinda this just, is kind of just Star Wars. Yeah, this is, I think, my favorite they have put out so far. Now, I am almost done <laughs> with Ascendancy, and it's awesome. <laughs> so next week, that may change. But <laughs> I think we haven't talked about it yet, but I'm I'm definitely still on Bloodlines. Or maybe uh, Catalyst. Oh, Catalyst. Oh, Catalyst is where we get it. Catalyst is yeah, we got to get that on the I really, get that on I, the really I do like the best listening to Aftermath, um, one, because it shows that peer pressure works, kids, and two – that we are that this stuff, as we've talked about, it's only like what, what did they say six months between Endor and Jakku, and Aftermath gave us this kind of big overview of that time. Uh-huh. But it seems like right now in some of their stories, they're really concentrating on this era to kind of wrap all this up. And so it, with this with the trajectory this book these books are taking, I can't imagine it not tying in again with the actual end of the Empire. And not to take anything away from your peer pressure, but also I am just a Star Wars sucker. So once a way to get around the horrible, horrible punctuation of Aftermath as it's written came to me, I I finally took it. He's a, he's an interesting Twitter Twitter follow, too. By the way. Oh, he's super funny, and I, I do like him. But he gets I himself just, in trouble every once in a while. But. Not a super fan of his writing style. Well, just get ready for my 45-minute discussion on why I love Nora Wexley. <laughs> we know you do. We know you do. We know you do. Stupid. And, and now after fucker. reading after reading through Aftermath, I kind of want to go back and read through Resistance Reborn again because now mm-hmm. I feel like I understand them a little better. Next week we're doing something a little different, Beth, are we? Well, we are going to do the audio play or whatever it was because I was an idiot and bought it as a book. So it's just a play on my Kindle. Uh, Dooku, Jedi Lost. Which is also the first audiobook I've ever listened to. Uh, Yeah, I haven't, I actually have not listened to that yet. I I bought it when it came out and have not listened to it. Well, now you have to. I'm very excited to. uh, I found it very interesting. Yeah, no, I'm I'm excited. So we get to learn a lot more about how Dooku became Dooku, and a whole lot about Asajj Ventress, that's, who's that's a very was. interesting character. I couldn't uh-huh. give a shit about Dooku, but I'm I'm very excited about Asajj Ventress. I, this may change it a little bit. I found I myself caring about so. Dooku a little more. I, I, yeah, listen, absolutely. Last time, after last time, I care about Padme a hell, hell, a hell of a lot more than I used to. So maybe Dooku will uh, do the same thing. I, I think you'll care more about Dooku after this. I do have more questions than answers about Sifo-Dyas after this, but we'll get into all of that soon. Dude, there could be papers written on sifo but the papers wouldn't end up with conclusions at all. <laughs> I have no idea who he is. I know they have said who he was. I think he's been dramatized in comics. I think he's been dramatized in books. He has. He, there he is was a in story. Darth Plagueis. That's right. He was in Darth Plagueis. There is a story there. I still don't really know. I still can't get a grasp on anything about. Well, Sifidius. then you need to listen to Dooku very soon. I No, I need to listen to Dooku because we're going like, to record about it in two weeks. Let's get my priorities straight here. <laughs> yes. I'll also do it to see if I can understand. Sifidius. Listen to Dooku sounds dirty. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. All right, I think that wraps us up for this week. So <laughs> take, us, take us out. I am so far. I'm so far. <laughs> if y'all stay on so, much longer, you're gonna have to listen to some Dooku. <laughs> yeah, you are. You really are. You so, really are. Hey, so if we gonna, keep going longer, we're gonna talk about this bullshit about Rocky Four. Oh no, we're we're stopping <laughs> now. Then. Thanks everybody for listening. Sly, what do you think you're doing, Sly? <laughs> Thanks for that, listening, and we'll that see whole you soon. Movie is that robot? You may bring back <laughs> communism. <laughs> If you undo Rocky for the Berlin Wall will go back up. <laughs> and on that, we're leaving. Good night.
You have been listening to a Needless Things podcast. You can follow Needless Things on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and at needlessthingspodcast.com. Love you. Mean it. Uh Uh-huh.